Today I'm going to talk about the physical ascension of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to go into great detail about all the things that happened between the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his physical ascension, uh, but what I am going to do is hit on a couple of really good points that I encourage people to study and pray about further. Please turn in your Bibles or look at the screen. I'm going to read Mark chapter 16, verses 19 and 20. Starting with verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following, Amen. Without Jesus Christ, his disciples could do nothing. Uh, God was with them after Jesus Christ ascends up into heaven, was received up into heaven. This is very important. Mark chapter 16, the ending of this chapter, contains powerful doctrine that is vital to Christians today. It tells us how we can be assured what signs follow them that believe. And importantly to this particular sermon lesson, uh, in verse 19, Jesus is received up into heaven. So the topics of the sermon today are going to be Jesus Christ says to his disciples he will go away. We've got some lessons, and I really want to focus on this, lessons before Jesus Christ ascends back up into heaven. What should we as Christians really focus on between the time of his resurrection and the time of his ascension? I've got uh, just a couple of lessons that I'm going to discuss there. Uh, also, Jesus Christ physically ascends to heaven, not just spiritually, he wasn't a ghost. Of course, Thomas touched him physically and verified that he was in his flesh. He is in his flesh. And I'm going to comment on that further. And then I'm going to give a brief conclusion. So starting things out, Jesus Christ says he will go away. It says in John chapter 16, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. I remember when I was born again, and I felt the Holy Spirit in me. And as I read the word of God, I could hear a voice in my head teaching me the precepts. And I knew it wasn't anything from me, but it was God's power that was taking over and teaching me his word. And there were things that entered into my mind that were not of this world. My whole life before I got born again, uh, certain parts of my life were shown to me and how foolish they were because of the words that I was reading and the guidance from the Holy Spirit. And the world was reproved because of their sin, because of disbelief, ultimately. And it was very powerful for me. And I didn't really expect any of that because I did not have knowledge of the Word of God until I read the Word of God. So it was uh, very much as exactly as Jesus Christ tells us in John chapter 16. Second part of what I want to talk about today is lessons before the ascension of Jesus Christ. People can study independently uh, as far as all of the things that were done by Jesus Christ between his resurrection and his ascension, but I want to hit on something that stands out personally to me. In John chapter 21, I'm going to read a few verses here. Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that the disciples should not die, 
Yet Jesus said not unto him, He shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Well, this worked out really well because I think I skipped a word. I believe it says in verse 23, Among the brethren that that disciple should not die. So, again, as, as a man, even though I'm born of the Spirit, I'm still in a fleshly body. I'm still going to make mistakes. And what we're learning about Peter is he's concerned about the Apostle John. What, what's, what about this guy, Jesus? What are you going to do to him? What's, what's going to happen to this man? What shall he do? And essentially, Jesus says, it doesn't matter, Peter. Um, you know, if I, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Uh, obviously, the implication is that uh, if, if it were God's will, uh, the Apostle John would, would remain alive until Jesus returns. And Jesus just tells Peter, follow thou me. He doesn't see, say, be like me. He says, follow thou me. In other words, believe, listen, have faith. And it says in verse 23, Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that that disciple should not die. Now, Jesus never said that, and he says that. We misquote or misrepresent scripture because we fall short of the glory of God, yet we walk in the Spirit justified by faith. And this is one of the lessons that I really wanted to point out today, and that is we learn in John chapter 21 that well-intentioned men will change what Jesus Christ says and say it abroad. And we're probably all guilty of this to some extent. Some examples recently today, have you ever heard anybody talk about the mark of the beast and taking the mark of the beast? Well, Jesus Christ never says anybody's going to take a mark. Uh, using the word rapture as an escape from tribulation? Well, the word rapture is not a word that Jesus Christ ever used. What about being Christ-like? Jesus never told us to be Christ-like, like him. He never says, be like me. He says, follow me. He said that to Peter. Peter is a great example because Peter, as I also mentioned in uh, last week's sermon lesson, is a zealot, and certainly we, we know he loves Jesus Christ very much, and he means well. And I think uh, all of us that are true Christians mean well. But God allows Peter to fail over and over and over, and he shows us our human nature. You know, Peter's more concerned about what's going on with John than than himself, you know, and it kind of reminds me of where, you know, where I'm going to paraphrase here, but we are to, you know, before we try to remove the splinter out of someone else's eye, we have to cast the beam out of our own. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but the whole idea is trust Jesus, follow Jesus, and don't misquote Jesus. And uh, when we're handling God's word, we need to pray and we need to edify one another using precept upon precept so that we don't privately interpret. So we must follow Jesus Christ. And it's interesting that Peter fails here. He's worried about John more than himself. Jesus rebukes him. And uh, basically in a gentle way, you know, three times in the same chapter, uh, you know, he asked Peter if he uh, loves him. And Peter says, of course. And he says, Feed my lambs. And then two more times he says, feed my sheep. Obviously, as people get on the milk of the word, then they will get on solid food. And those three gentle rebukes to Peter, to me, symbolize the three denials that Peter uh, made by denying that he knew Jesus Christ before the crucifixion got underway. Uh, but it's interesting that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, that God moves Peter by the Holy Spirit to record that we are not to privately interpret Scripture. And that's a powerful lesson that I wanted to really point out is uh, Jesus Christ, before he ascends, he leaves us with this powerful lesson that 
let's concern ourselves about following Jesus Christ and not worry about, um, you know, what everybody else is up to and what God's going to do with them. That's the will of the Father. We need to worry about ourselves and pray and get convicted by the Holy Spirit to testify about Jesus Christ in truth. So I just wanted to comment on that. The third part I wanted to cover is Jesus Christ physically ascends to heaven. In Mark chapter 16, verse 19, it says, So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Uh, we know that Jesus did return to heaven. And Mark chapter 16, as I mentioned earlier, is extremely important uh, for the doctrine of the ascension. And what I wanted to do is something different. I wanted to point out an Old Testament prophecy that relates to the ascension of Jesus Christ. In Proverbs chapter 30, starting with verse 4, it says, Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. And of course, I referenced John chapter 14, where Jesus says, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In John chapter 1, where it says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, very important because the Old Testament foreshadows Jesus Christ all throughout, and this is a particular passage that I wanted to quote that foreshadows the ascension of Jesus Christ uh, for our sake, for our sins, because God is using the, uh, the wind, which we know is symbolic of doctrine, and uh, water is the water of the word, and of course, Every word is pure. So it's certainly foreshadowing Jesus Christ coming for our sake. In 2 John chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Uh, Jesus Christ is in his eternal glorified body of flesh, that's very important because the world is trying to contradict that. The world is trying to cast doubt on the physical ascension of Jesus Christ uh, back into heaven. I'll comment more on that in upcoming sermon lessons. Um, but any, uh, any spirit, any Bible that does not confess Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, if you believe God's word is the 1611, authorized version, then this is a deceiver and an antichrist, which throws virtually every other modern Bible, or all modern Bibles, virtually all of them, under the bus. In other words, they're all antichrist Bibles, if they don't say, is come in the flesh, in accordance with not only 2 John chapter 1, verse 7, but 1 John chapter 4, the first three verses. So that's a, a, a very uh, easy way to separate uh, lamps with or without oil, as we learned about in Matthew chapter 25. So in conclusion, the physical ascension of Jesus Christ is needed so that believers can receive the Holy Spirit and get saved. We learn not to privately interpret scripture that many corrupt. Peter is a great example for us on problems and solutions. So Peter, we see the problems with Peter in uh, John chapter 21, but we see also that God in his great mercy allows Peter to be a prophet to give us the solution in one of the books of the New Testament that Peter's name is on. Uh, so Peter ultimately is allowed to give solutions in our walk as Christians. Uh, we do not believe many modern Bibles that now cast doubt on Mark chapter 16, verse 19, by saying that some manuscripts omit this verse. Um, I looked the other night, and virtually almost all modern Bibles cast doubt on Mark chapter 16, the last 12 verses. 
And uh, I'm going to talk more about this next week. I don't want to get sidetracked right now, but the importance of Jesus Christ's physical ascension cannot be uh, understated. Uh, without Jesus Christ physically ascending back into heaven by his own words, you know, he can't send us the Holy Spirit. And if he can't do that, then how can we be saved? We're condemned already. So we need to believe on his word, put our trust in him, and have faith so that we can be born again and do the will of the Father. Thank you for listening, and I will look forward to discussing in the upcoming weeks more about how the world tries to contradict the ascension of Jesus Christ. Thanks for listening. God bless everyone.